Hey, Dr. Armstrong here. Hope you're all doing well. We're looking at uh, chapter seven today, the hip joint. Um, basically, we're looking at the pelvic bone and uh, it is, um, not, I don't think the book talks about it, but it does in the PowerPoints. Uh, we call it the innominate, which basically means nameless, the innominate bone. Uh, but it's actually three bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Now, the, the, note, the, note the slides in the PowerPoint. They list a lot of, uh, of the muscle attachments f to each one of those three bones, and it's about the same number for each. Um, make sure that you look at all the... All the um, points of, of uh, not only attachment, but uh, the landmarks on the pelvic bone. Um, and as, as you are looking at the attachments, um, ask yourself, would, would the muscles attach by their proximal or distal attachment? Keeping in mind that, first of all, you'll recall that when a muscle contracts, it contracts equally uh, from the middle to both ends. But then the proximal attachment is usually the one that's, first of all, closer to the midline, secondly, the one that's more stable, and, um, and the distal is the one that usually is, goes along with the moving bone. Well, you're going to find that, for the most part, uh, with, the, with the pelvic bone, you're going to have the uh, proximal attachment. Uh, the pelvic bone is also called the pelvic girdle, uh, which, unlike the shoulder girdle, attaches all the way around. And this makes it stronger, obviously. It also makes it uh, less flexible. <clears throat> um, one other thing to, to note, um, in terms of the, uh, when, if you go back to the types of uh, joints, back from the beginning, we talked about um, the synarthrotic and the diarthrotic and the amphiarthrotic. Um, with the pubis bone, we have uh, an amphiarthrotic joint because it's not totally unmovable. Uh, there is cartilage uh, between the two bones. Uh, it's not meant to move, uh, but if it does, um, it, you have some play in the bone itself. Can you imagine the pelvic bone if it were just one big bone and, and uh, didn't didn't have articulations in the back or the front, and you were to um, uh, have an injury. Uh, a lot of times, uh, people who fall off of horses, uh, that's, that's not uncommon for them to suffer uh, an injury to the, to the symphysis pubis. <clears throat> but like I said, this is the, an amphiarthrotic joint. It's not meant to move, <clears throat> but if it does, you do have that, that uh, uh, s little bit of allowance there. Let's talk a little about some of the muscles. Uh, the ilio iliopsoas. This is a combination of two muscles, the iliacus and the psoas. These are two separate muscles, but we talk about them as one, basically. Um, the, uh, the pictures in the PowerPoint, there's a couple of them uh, for the iliopsoas, and, it, and they show them in shaded, so you can see which is the iliacus, which is the psoas. They basically do the same thing together. They, they flex the hip, they externally rotate the femur, um, and if you, oh, old school sit-ups, the kind where, I'm sure that you weren't taught to do them this way, but where you're sitting on the floor, your legs are, are straight, and somebody's holding your ankles, and you go up and down, up and down, and um, basically those types of sit-ups tend to strengthen maybe the hip flexors more than the, uh, the abs. And in this case, it'd be a good, a good uh, exercise for the iliopsoas. And the reason that you're, you're exercising, keep this in mind, is that you're engaging the iliopsoas because the knees are straight. Now, if you were to bend the knees, you disengage the iliopsoas. And, and that's why when we do uh, the crunches, you're familiar with those probably, um, where you don't go all the way up, you don't go all the way down, and you do have your, your knees bent, that's where you're working strictly with the abs. <clears throat> the sartorius muscle, as you probably know, is the longest muscle in the body. 
Um, there's an extended discussion of the sartorius in the PowerPoint, uh, even the etymology of the word itself. Um, it is involved in hip and knee flexion. Now, note that it's flexion for both, unlike the rectus femoris, which is flexion and extension. But the, uh, if you look at the distal attachment of the uh, sartorius, it goes, it goes beneath the uh, condyle uh, at, the, at the knee, it's, so it's on the, on the distal side. Therefore, when it, when it pulls that way, it's going to flex the knee. So it's flexion of the hip and flexion of the knee. Now it crosses two joints. Uh, so it, when you're doing one action, it tends to weaken or at least compromise the other in terms of that muscle. So for example, if you're, if you're flexing the hip and you have full flexion of the hip and then you try to flex your knee at the same time, well, it's not that you can't do it, but, it's, but the sartorius probably is not that active in it. Or if you do it the other way around, if you flex the knee and then you try to flex the hip, uh, again, you have to rely on some of the other hip flexor muscles. The rectus femoris is obviously one of the quads. And the reason that, you only, that we only look at the rectus in this chapter as opposed to uh, the, the other three uh, is that uh, the rectus femoris uh, does cross two joints. It's involved in hip flexion, which is why it's included in this chapter. Uh, it's the strongest of the four quads, obviously. Um, hip flexion, knee extension. And um, li like the sartorius, like the sartorius, in terms of doing both actions, this is even more pronounced. So if you were to uh, flex the hip and then try to straighten out your knee, extending it, <clears throat> it'd be, uh, it would be uh, more difficult because you already have, have uh, um, flexed the, uh, contracted the rectus femoris in hip flexion, and there's not much left there in terms of knee extension. And it's a primary knee extender, so uh, it, you're, you're unlikely to get much, much action there at all. Um, like I said, it is the strongest of the, of the quads. Um, the tensor fascia lata uh, sounds like a, a drink that you pick up at Starbucks, I know. Uh, but it's along the side of the hip. Uh, it's involved in flexion of the hip, but also abduction, abduction. So it pulls the hip uh, and the leg away from the midline. Uh, now, this muscle is associated with the iliotibial band syndrome. Uh, this is where when you, you will tend to have, and it, it affects runners a lot, especially distance runners, where you get inflammation uh, right about at the knee joint, where the distal tendon of the tensor fascia lata rubs against the lateral condyle. And it does so because it's inflamed. And so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's swollen. And think about the running action. Uh, each time that you, you bring the, uh, the lower leg through in recovery, um, that distal tendon is crossing the condyle. Now, there's a, uh, an illustration that I had put in, in your text right there, and then there's an extended discussion in the PowerPoint about a way to uh, continue to train with ITB syndrome, and you do so by either running hills, steep hills, or you uh, get on the treadmill going up, uh, raise the treadmill. Now, what this does is that when you are re in the recovery phase of the bringing the leg forward, it never quite straightens the knee out. Therefore, the distal tendon never comes quite close enough to crossing uh, the condyle. So therefore, you don't have that, uh, um, the irritation going on. So ITB is, is mainly uh, a condition uh, associated with pain. Uh, it's not that if you continue to... Um, to exercise on um, a swollen or inflamed tendon or muscle you're not, that you're not going to hurt it. But in this particular case, you can continue to train uh, 
even though it, it's irritated, and you do so by um, by adjusting your gait. <clears throat> the gluteals, uh, obviously we have the, the maximus, the minimus, and the medius. Um, the maximus, obviously, is the, uh, the strongest of the three. It's, uh, it's the uh, one that's most superficial. Uh, it's involved in hip extension and uh, ex um, exterior uh, uh, rotation of the femur. Uh, interestingly enough, the um, maximus does not really engage as a major uh, extender until you have about 15 degrees of um, separation between the pelvis and the femur when you walk. So, for example, if you are uh, if you're doing you know the power walking and, and you're getting you're taking long steps and you you measure that angle and it's it doesn't take a whole lot to get 15 degrees. But if you're just walking along casually, you're not really going to engage the, the maximus. Uh, so that's one reason, uh, those of you who are going to be teaching, those of you who will be in, in um, uh, the clinic, if, you talk, if, you're, if you're coaching somebody, you're talking about walking and engaging the, the maximus, that's what you want to encourage people to do, is to uh, take long enough strides, you have at least 15 degrees of separation between the femur and the pelvic bone, uh, therefore you engage the uh, maximus. <clears throat> the minimus is also is, uh, involved <clears throat> mainly as a hip abductor, and it's an internal rotator of the femur. And the medius um, is, a, is also a hip, hip abductor, but it is an external rotator. And to go back to the minimus for just a second, uh, the minimus is, cannot be palpated because it's underneath the two. Uh, just a few notes about the hamstrings. Um, <clears throat> note that in the PowerPoint where uh, the distal tendons attach at the knee joint, the reason I want you to be, to be aware of this is that um, the, uh, the biceps femoris, the, uh, the distal tendon is the one that you're going to feel on the lateral side to the knee. And then the, uh, the semitendinosus and the semimembranosus as well as the gracilis, those are the tendons that are going to be uh, on the inside, um, of, uh, on the inside at the knee. Those are the, that's where you're going to find those distal tendons. Uh, the biceps femoris is uh, the strongest of the three, and it obviously, actually all three of them cross two joints. All three of them are involved in hip extension and knee flexion. So, um, I find it interesting that when you go into the weight room now, uh, no longer, do, if you want to do um, hamstrings on the machine, uh, you don't have to lay down. I always found that to be a little bit annoying or kind of difficult to, to get into the position. And, and now we have the sitting hamstring machines. And uh, it accommodates us a little better and you can get the same exercise out of it. Um, Note that when we have, when we look at the hamstrings versus the quads, and we'll look at this uh, again in the next chapter, but just to talk about it now, uh, there is an inherent strength difference, obviously, four muscles versus three. Um, and even with somebody who is working both muscle groups, you're always going to have a, a strength difference, <clears throat> which is why, um, there's a, there are a lot of people will, will tend to get on the hip ex, the uh, knee extension machine, and so you work in the quad, uh, but less likely to do the hamstring. And those of you who will be in the clinic or or coaching or in the gym, uh, working with students, you always want to emphasize if you're going to do one uh, muscle group, you want to do the antagonistic muscle group, and in this case, hamstring, um, and. <clears throat> and the uh, biceps femoris uh, and the, uh, the, the vast, vast tie, which we'll look at in the next chapter. Um, <clears throat> one of the, another thing about the hamstrings, uh, if there's anybody, any of those of you who are sprinters or have sprinted in the past, um, 
a lot of times short sprinters, uh, I don't mean short in stature, but those who are, who are um, 100 meter sprinters, well, it's not uncommon for them to pull a hamstring. And you see somebody coming down the, down the, uh, the track and all of a sudden they'll grab the hamstring and kind of pull up. And uh, we, a lot of times we'll blame that on uh, a lack of coaching, or not coaching, but a lack of stretching, maybe coaching, a uh, lack of stretching, uh, the cold weather, uh, but but probably more than anything, it's it is a um, a neglect to training the hamstring. Again, because think about it, if you slow it down in your mind, and what happens is when when you're sprinting and your your lower leg comes through on the recovery phase. Now, what stops it? What stops it from coming all the way out straight? Well, it's the, it's, the, it's the quad. And so we know the quad overall is stronger than the hamstring. So when it comes out, uh, the, the, well, the quad, is, I take, the quad is going to bring it out. What's going to stop that action? It's the hamstring. Okay, so I'm backing up here. We, you, uh, the quad uh, extends the lower leg and what keeps it from going any farther than you know about 40 degrees it's the hamstring now um, <clears throat> if the hamstring is is to some degree weak and you try to stop that action that's when 